Hello, hello, Rockstars. Oh, we have feedback. Hang on. Ooh, that was a crisis. All right, we have started our time off together with a bang. Welcome to Foundation Paper Piecing Fan Camp. My name is Holly and Knight of String and Story, and it is my job to guide you to quote with confidence. I'm going to turn this slightly so that we don't have to look at my iPhone the whole time. Um, we are here today to talk about Foundation Paper Piecing. I'm really hoping you got your workbook and all the good stuff. While we're getting settled in, let me just say hello to some of the 100 of you who are here with me live. If you have not yet popped into the chat, please do so. My favorite, favorite thing when we are here live together and Sue left the first comment and she knows my favorite thing is when y'all are chatty. So be conversational in that chat box. Do not fear interrupting me. Um, I will ignore you until it's time for me to take a breath. And then I'm going to make sure that I get all of your questions answered. Okay. So to that end, good morning, Sue, Franzi, Craft Diva, Sue, Judy, Melanie, Rebecca, Anne, Susan, Nancy, Cynthia, Sherry, Sandra, Sherry, Miriam, Lisa, Artie, Rockstar. Oh my gosh, Dawn. Wanda, Danielle, Brandy, L.A., Wendy, Wanda, Martha, Kate, Quilt Know How, Karen, Juliet, Tina, Helen, Heather, 100 Proof Quilter, that's hilarious, <laughs> Dinah, Nancy, Kelly, um, Heather and Kate again, Michelle, Julia, Holly, Mary, it is absolutely wonderful to have all of you here and Deb who just popped in as well. So Rockstars, let me, I'm going to throw our slides up quickly. Uh, because I want to make sure that you have all the things that you need. I'm going to make sure I have the right links copied on my clipboard. All right. You, my dears, are in the right place. You have arrived at Quilting Rockstar Bandcamp, Intro to Foundation Paper Piecing. My name is Holly and Knight of String and Story, and it is my job to guide you to quilt with confidence. And I am so excited today to take you through three main parts of our program together. The first is we're going to talk about what the heck is foundation paper piecing and what do you need in order to do it. The second part, we're actually going to make some very adorable little economy blocks together. And we're going to hope and pray that I remembered to grab all of my things from my multiple sewing spaces. <laughs> um, and then the third thing we're going to do together is we're going to talk about this amazing quilt that's behind me and that is also on your screen, the Palazzo Block of the Month with Aurafil. This quilt is designed by Kitty Wilton, Wilkin of Night Quilter. Kate, doesn't it look so good? It makes me so happy. So, okay, true confessions. And this will probably not be the only true confession that y'all get uh, throughout our time together today. Uh, but this is truly a sample. So this is a, um, a printed panel of what is the foundation paper piece sample because I don't have all the parts yet because I'm going to be quilting it along with y'all. But I wanted to show y'all the vision for how beautiful this quilt is and how fun it's going to be to get to sew it together. Okay. Hello, Quinn. Hello, Kat. Hello, Regina. Hello, hello. So a couple of quick announcements. We will be together for about 90 minutes today. Uh, that's why I resisted my urge to chit chat for too long right at the beginning of our time together. Um, wanted to go ahead and get my slides up so that we could jump straight in. If for any reason you miss part of this, you have any technical issues, you have to jump off and take the dog out or you have to get the kids a snack or anything else, the replay will be available immediately following this broadcast, okay? That's one of the beautiful things about doing it here on YouTube is as soon as I'm done, you can catch that replay. So don't fear if you get interrupted. It also means that if we're stitching along together and maybe we're working on this economy block and you're like, whoa, I really need to watch that step a second time, don't worry. You'll be able to do that as soon as we wrap up. All right. Uh, the third thing is that if you are tuning in and you do not yet have the workbook, I am dropping a link right now in the chat. You can click that link. You'll put in your email address and it will email you this lovely workbook. So this workbook talks all about what foundation paper piecing is, the supplies that you need. So all the stuff we're talking about together today. And then not only does it include back here at the back the um, template for what I am sewing on today, it actually has step-by-step -step photos going through and talking you through the steps to make that economy block. Now, I am going to tell you, it's going to talk about an old block of the month at the back of the workbook. We haven't updated it yet, but that's okay because I'm going to give you all the information that you need about our current beautiful block of the month while we're here together live. All right. I'm going to drop that link one more time just to help it not get lost in there. If you tune in and you're like, shoot, I didn't catch that. You just let me know. 
and I can always drop it again. Okay, so let's get going. If you're new around here, as I mentioned, I'm Holly and Knight of String and Story, and it is my job to guide you to quilt with confidence. I live here in Duluth, Georgia with my very adorable family. You'll see them in the bottom right of this screen. Those boys are a lot bigger now, though. Let me tell you what, the one on the far right, Jim, he is nine and Ian on the left turned eight. Um, we are out on the town green often. I am in the shop often. Um, and when I'm not doing one of those two things, it's probably because I'm out on a run somewhere uh, trying to train for the Chicago Marathon. So I'm running Chicago this fall with Team JDRF. Um, if you saw my introduction on, on the Orophil Instagram page, uh, JDRF is a type one diabetes research foundation. My husband and my older son both have type one. Uh, so I'm running the marathon for them and for the research related to their health, which, you know, it's pretty exciting. So quilting and running huge parts of my life. Um, Alicia is making a cameo here at our lovely photo, which makes me super happy. I'm so glad you're here, Alicia. I love that. As I mentioned, at the end of our time together today, I am going to invite you to join us inside Palazzo. This is our one, two, three. Three. Is this our fourth year? Kate, help me. Um, I believe this is our fourth year in a row doing Orville Color Builders here at String and Story, and I'm a little bit obsessed. So my first passion is free motion quilting, which means I want all the thread at all times. And I'm a really big believer in all of us having comprehensive thread stashes that are not so big that we don't know what to do with them, but that we're not stuck on a Sunday morning going, well, shoot, I really need an orange. I have no orange. And that means I can't do what I wanted to do today. Right? So that's one of my favorite things about Orville Color Builders is it builds a really useful thread stash um, in a size that is still manageable and usable. And we get to do a cool quilt together. Phenomenal. But more about that in a few minutes. Let's jump in to foundation paper piecing. Do y'all have any questions thus far? You have probably figured out that I talk a mile a minute. I almost apologize for that, but I'm not gonna apologize for that. That's how we get so much done. But it also means that I know that sometimes I need to repeat myself. So don't hesitate to ask me to repeat myself. Any questions about what we're doing and where we're headed today? Kate, I feel the same way. Where does the time go? How has it been four years already? Um, I am also a beverage goblin. So you will see three different cups in my hands as we're together today. Those of you who have been here for a minute, you're used to this. If you're new, it's water, a smoothie, and a cup of coffee. Because listen, we got we to gotta keep the energy flowing. <laughs> Heather, I am so excited to run with JDRF. I've been running for a few years now, but uh, every time I'm out for a run, and I start thinking about why I'm taking on this endeavor of 26.2 miles, I start crying. So I get a little, oh yeah, it's, it's close to my heart for sure. All right. And Nigeria has entered the chat. Welcome, Uzoma. It's amazing to have you here. I don't know if we've ever had someone tune in from Nigeria before. That's amazing. Huzzah. All right, let's do this. So get your workbook out and you can literally follow along with me almost page by page, slide by slide. So if you are also a visual learner and you like to hold the thing in your hands, that's going to be helpful. What is foundation paper piecing? All right. Foundation paper piecing is a precision piecing technique that uses paper as a template to create very specific shapes. Often those shapes come together to make a larger picture. I like to think of this as paint by number. Okay. This is paint by number for quilters. It is done in little sections and then you put those sections together to make larger pictures, okay? So for example, on this tiger, I know y'all can't quite see my mouse, um, but if you look at this tiger's face, up around the nose, you'll see that there's kind of a funky little shape, and then you'll see a section of whiskers is a funky little shape, right? So this tiger gets put together in pieces first, and then he comes together as a whole. And that's the really amazing thing um, about foundation paper piecing is that if we were to set out and try to do traditional piecing for a quilt like this, we would never get past the cutting of like, how do I even cut that shape? How do I make sure it's the right size and shape, right? But foundation paper piecing allows us to make really unique shapes out of our fabric so that quilts can look like this. Um, and Kate, yeah, this is one of my favorites from that quilt as well. It was a lot to put together, but so, so, so fun. So like I said, foundation paper piecing is a bit like paint by number for quilters. But here's the thing. If you jump straight in on something like the tiger, that can feel a little overwhelming. Now, because it's paint by number, you truly are going, you know, one, two, three, like you're piecing it step by step. 
And I really think that any foundation paper piecing of any skill level can jump into pretty complicated patterns and achieve a lot of success. But I know that that can also feel a little bit overwhelming, okay? So that's why I'm really excited today that we can start with a really beginner-friendly block that is repeating shapes over and over. And it's something that I really love about this Palazzo quilt is that there's a lot of repetition. So it allows you to feel really, really confident with those foundational movement skills and steps of foundation paper piecing. Once you do this with me today, you are perfectly equipped to do this. Once you do this, you can foundation paper piece anything you want. All right, so let's talk about supplies. Um, yes, all of these supplies are available in our online shop. I'm going to grab a link for you because I'm thinking about it. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Give me just a second. So if you are brand new to this and you do not yet have supplies, just know we have them available to you. Um, ba -ba -da. I will say big giant asterisk here. I'm going to mention a lot of supplies today. I'm going to talk about the supplies that are on this slide. I'm going to talk about a sewing machine. I'm going to talk about fabric bundles that go with Palazzo. There's a lot of y'all here. So just a little reminder, be patient with us. There are like three of us that do shipping at String and Story. So as all of y'all get excited, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> blueberry seed. As all of y'all get excited and are jumping in, just know it might take us a day or two to get stuff out to you. Just be patient. All right, let's talk about supplies. First up, you need fabric. Fabric might look like this, or it might look like this. Now notice, these are little scrappy bits. These are actually left over from a shop sample we've been working on. Um, from This is Ruby Star Society's Meadow Star by Alexia Abeg. Um, and all these little bits and bobs are perfect for foundation paper piecing because little weird scraps work well with little weird shapes. Now, if you jump in and pull out, so you might do something like this amazing rainbow bundle um, and start with some fat quarters and then cut them down to be the funky sizes and shapes that we need as we're going along. My number one tip, my number one tip, if you are brand new to foundation paper piecing, is to use solids because then there's not a right and wrong side. When we stitch together today, I'm going to intentionally use printed fabric so that we talk about right side and wrong side. Um, but if you're just getting started, solids eliminate a little bit of mental load and make it a lot easier. So that's one of my favorite things about like this block of the month, super solid friendly. And that's going to make it a wonderful place if you're new to FPP or just wanting something that's not overly complicated, right? You, of course, are going to need a sewing machine. I'm going to be sewing on a Burnett B77 today. We carry Burnett's here at String and Story. And uh, between you and me, it's on a really screaming deal right now. So if you are looking for a new machine, looking for an upgrade, looking for a travel machine, we can talk about that. You're going to need a size 14 or size 16 needle. So we want a needle that is a little bit more hefty because we're going to be going through paper. Um, Orifil's official recommendation for 50 weight thread, I believe, is a size 12. Um, I like to bump that size up because I'm doing a funky thing with it, it you know, sewing through paper. All right. Cotton thread, Orifil 50 weight. I'm in a deeply committed relationship with Orifil 50 weight thread. Your pattern like this. And then a few little bits and bobs. So I like to have an add a quarter ruler. It has this fun little lip on the back for adding our seam allowance. Um, I usually use a 28 millimeter rotary cutter just because it works well with some of these smaller bits and pieces. Um, and then a little seam roller. So I finger press in between each of my seams. I don't hit my sections with the iron until towards the end to save myself the up and down, but a little roller will alleviate the stress on my fingers from all that finger pressing. Okay. Batiks work really well. Things that are two-sided. Yes. Um, and there's a question about endangered species. Uh, I think they're still available through Orifil. So that would be the route to go to inquire about that. All right. Here are some optional supplies. Now, I just mentioned the add a quarter ruler because I don't think that I would foundation paper piece without it anymore. I've been doing it for too long. Um, Lisa, who's on this call that I geeked out about her presence earlier, I think you were the one who sent me my very first add a quarter ruler, if I remember correctly. This was many, many moons ago. Um, and Lisa is an OG quilting rock star. And we were talking about foundation paper piecing. And she's like, listen, girl, you need an add a quarter. And I was like, no, no, no. I don't need one more gizmo and gadget in my sewing room. And she was like, <laughs> what's your address? And then she changed my life. So here we are. 
Um, they also make an add an eighth version. So if you're doing something like the tiger that we looked at a couple of minutes ago, doing an eighth of an inch seam allowance can help reduce some of that bulk and be really, really handy. Okay. Other optional supplies to consider would include a Daylight Company wafer light box. So it's a really thin light box that can lay right down next to your sewing machine. And they make the wafer cutting mat that can go on top of it. So it makes it a little bit easier to see where your fabric is lining up, make sure that it's covering the entire area it is supposed to, and then do all your trimming right there on the light box next to your machine. Okay. All right. We carry, as I mentioned, a number of foundation paper piecing tools and supplies here at String and Story, including these handy dandy kits. So I will drop that link one more time to all of our foundation paper piecing tools and supplies, just in case you need to snag any of these for practicing your foundation paper piecing skills or for jumping into Palazzo with us. All right. Any questions about supplies and tools? I just went through these at a million miles an hour. I go through them very, very quickly because you're about to see them in practice, right? We're going to actually start stitching here together momentarily, and you're going to see what it looks like when I use them. But if you have any questions about them already, I would love to answer those. I'm just starting to rearrange my stuff to, to be able to sew. All right. Fire those questions off if you think of them in a minute. Please don't hesitate. All right, so let's talk about the square and a square economy block. I've been holding them up repeatedly as we've been here talking together. These are also made with cute little ruby star fabrics. Um, what I really like about this block for teaching foundation paper piecing is that the shapes repeat. So we have a nice little fussy cut opportunity here in the center. Um, and then these triangles are all the same, just at different scales. So we can talk through the steps of how to foundation paper piece, and then we're going to do it over and over and over again. Okay. Now here's the really fun part. Um, could we get an email for these? Yes. If you head to the link that I dropped at the beginning, where's my link? Here we go. You can get this workbook, Uzoma, that has all the information that you need. Perfect. All right. Let me pull these slides down and we're going to throw this up. Let's see. Can I make it? I wonder if I can make my face smaller and this bigger. Can I do it like this? Shift seven. All right, let's try that. Nope. Press shift plus seven. Mm, okay, guess it's not going to work for us. Okay, we'll have a side by side layout. Let's do the fun thing together. All right, so if you have not already, you're going to take your economy block papers that are in your workbook. What's great about this being a PDF is that you can print one trillion of these. And I encourage you to do that. That is the whole point of me giving you this template. And so that if you want to make an entire quilt's worth of these, you can. You could make them bigger, right? These are four inch finished. You could make them so they're eight inch finished, okay? So just print it uh, bigger. Oh, this is really great to know. So Melanie mentions if you're printing out the workbook, they may print a little small. So bear that in mind. Here's the great thing. As long as you print them all the same, uh, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Just something to keep in mind as you then, you know, cut sashing or anything else to go in here. Yep. Yeah. Print on nice thin paper. I do use regular printer paper though. Um, you can buy specialty FPP paper and that has honestly just never been my jam. There we go. Okay. Um, this never been my jam because I don't like to have to remember one more specialty thing. Uh, the only time I have ever printed my FPP templates on specialty paper was the time uh, before QuiltCon Atlanta that I accidentally printed it on labels. You can imagine how fun that was when I was sitting on stage and went, and now we're going to remove the papers. No, we're not. <laughs> so I hang on th to this one to keep me humble and because it makes me laugh every single time. So that's also a reminder to make sure that it is just printer paper and your printer. Yep. A nice and expensive printer paper is exactly the trick. Then we're going to select our fabrics. Now, I have all of these gorgeous little Ruby Star Society bits, um, and we're going to find something fun to put in the center. Let's do a little bit of fussy cutting. We could put a flower in the center. I will hold these up so you can see them better, fear not. If we put a flower in the center, then maybe we'll do these little red dots for our next round. Now, notice, here's my favorite thing about FPP. You don't have to cut 
before you start, right? Like we're going to cut some big chunks, but I can sit down and say, I want to make a block. And then I just proceed to pick out the bits that I want to use. And I don't have to do a bunch of pre-cutting. Since cutting is my least favorite part of the quilting process, this is a huge selling point for me. All right. All right. And then I'm going to use this like super ugly green because we really love gross green at String and Story. If you come into our store, like 50% of stuff is bound in this snot green color. Go figure. All right. Now, this is the front of your template. All of your fabric is going to show up back here. Okay. So this is where this is also a really great example, right? Here's the finished block. Here's my template here on the back. All right. So it's mirror image of what I'm looking at. This is a symmetrical block. So it's not super complicated, but it's just, you know, good to keep in mind. All right. Yes. Amazon pa sells packages of newsprint for the printer. Ooh, I love that. I have not tried that, but it kind of makes me want to. All right. Am I going to be able to fit? I want a daisy in the center, but I need a different piece of fabric. Ooh, or do I want this in the center? Ooh, decisions. Y'all, why are decisions hard? Nope. I don't want that in the center. Do I want this in the center? So the reason that I'm saying I need a different piece of fabric is because if I hold this up, none of the daisies land in the middle, right? And if I move it down, then I don't have enough seam allowance. See how I'm right on this line up here? Here, I should put it on this side so y'all can actually see the line. Like I'm right on my line and I need to have a little bit of seam allowance. So Orphil Thrive Color 515, is that snot green, Kate? Is that what you're telling me? Do I need snot green thread in my life? <laughs> Let's see. Heather says, I'm working on a Christmas crazy quilt FPP. I'm logged in today to get ticks and trips from the rock star leader. Oh my gosh. You're amazing. I am so glad you're here. All right. So I've laid down. Y'all can see a little bit better with this camera. I'm going to be continually moving it around. I'm so sorry. I'll try not to make you motion sick. Um, but here's my flower in the middle, right? And I can see that it's right underneath my one. And then I can actually fold kind of out of the way here and just trim this piece. Now, the question I always get asked when I am teaching this, what about fabric waste? If being the most economical quilter with your fabric is your number one value as a quilter, then FPP, as I am teaching it to you, is going to be hard for you. I'm going to encourage you to release that. Okay. And embrace the fact that this is really scrap friendly. Um, and embrace the fact that all the little nubbins that we trim off of these edges can become bits further out in our triangle. Okay. So there are ways to reuse it and to be more thrifty. If you are constantly trying to cut the smallest piece of fabric possible, you will continually run the risk of it coming up short. Okay. There are methods for foundation paper piecing that have you cut out all of these bits first and turn them into templates and cut your pieces out exactly at size. There is no way ever, well, if I say ever, then it'll happen. There's very little chance of me ever doing that because I am not that patient or that precise. I quilt for joy units. And that level of attention to detail does not allow me to listen to an audiobook at the same time that I am quilting and thus diminishes my joy units. Okay. So I do it this way. It has a little bit more waste. If it's very important to you to have less waste and have the maximum amount of precision after you master this, there are other techniques you can dive into. Okay. Um, Sue says, do you pre-fold your paper? I've seen other tutorials that show that. I don't, I don't, I dive right in recklessly. It's wonderful. Okay. So I have got my little flower is centered here and I have dropped a pin into the center piece to hold that in place. Okay. Notice that my fabric is facing right side out from the back. Okay. Because that's the way that we need it to look when our block is done. All right. Then we take our next bit of fabric. All right. And we can see, you know, these, these triangles are not very big. That's the corner. So if I cut a big old square and truly the amount of eyeballing on this is incredible. Okay. 
And I'm going to see if I can go ahead and cut a triangle. When I hold this triangle up, I want it to be at least a quarter of an inch bigger in all directions. All right. And it is. So it's all on that. And then we can cut this other one. And I now have four triangles for my little first round. So let's piece it. Okay. All right. Number one. Number two. So this is going to be the triangle we do next. And we're going to put our fabrics right sides together, just like if you were doing regular piecing. Okay. There's this whole thing about, okay, foundation paper piecing is like dancing like Ginger Rogers. It's backward and in high heels. And there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of truth to that, right? Because of the mirror image effect. But it, there are a lot of things that are really the same, okay? We want to end with all of our fabric facing right sides out. And in order to piece it together, we put it right sides together. So I've got my daisy here. I'm doing number two because you literally were going to count to 13 on this block together, okay? And so that means that on this side, I'm going to lay, let me get you closer. I'm going to lay my fabrics right sides together. This is where a light box comes in handy so that you can see whether or not you're a quarter of an inch over. I'm going to come to this side and I'm going to put my finger there and go, okay, that's where my seam allowance is. If I tease myself up, am I covering in all directions? I have a light right here that I'm going to use as well. All right, there we go. All right, so now when I sew this and flip this up, it's going to fill up that number two triangle. All right. Put a pin in there. These first couple of times you do this, it is going to feel so awkward and fiddly. Okay. You will find your rhythm very, very quickly. And especially in something like this, where the shapes are really repeatable, the shapes are really repeatable on Palazzo as well. Once you do a couple, you're like, okay, we got this. We got this. All right. So our shapes are right sides together. We're going to put the paper up. I'm going to reduce my stitch length just a little bit on my machine here. This machine defaults to 2.5. I like the foundation paper piece at a 1.8. It's a really fine stitch. Make sure your fabrics don't fold as you slide your paper under there. And then stitch down the line. My pin is over here under my foot out of the way, so I don't bother removing it. All right. So I've stitched right here on this line. I got to make sure I'm lined up so y'all can see. Stitch right here on this line. You can see that on the back as well. It's not quite a full quarter inch seam, but honestly, that is going to be a-okay. Then we want to fold this up on that seam. And hold this up to a light so you can make sure, yes, it covers past the two and leaves the seam allowance. All right. Fold that fabric back down, right sides together, and come to your cutting mat. I'm going to scoot closer so y'all can see this. This is where we fold our paper. Fold your paper out of the way because we need to make a seam allowance or all of this bulk is going to add up big time. Okay. This is where your add a quarter ruler comes in. It locks right against the fold of that paper. And now we have a beautiful little piece. It's going to look wonky because you haven't enclosed it on the other side yet. Okay. But you've officially done your first little step of foundation paper piecing. Let's do it again. Okay. We're now going to number three. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to take our triangle. Okay. We are going to put it. I'm going to put this where y'all can actually see. We're going to put it right side down. Holding it in place, I'm going to flip over and fiddle with it until I can see that it's lined up past the line on this paper. I have a light. I'm going to hold up and use the light. So if you don't have a light box, if you have a task light, like a daylight slim line, it will do the trick as well. Wink. Think that'll do. All right. Then drop a pen just to hold it in place. Okay. And we're going to sew. 
<laughs> my very high tech camera setup here of scooting the tripod back and forth. Now, on these, if you were to do one, five, three, four, instead of one, two, three, four, five, right? Like if you were to go, you know, one, two, five, three, it's not going to make a huge difference because all of these bits are the same. On something like this, having things in the right order is going to shape the item, okay? Now's our test. Fold it up. See how much crisper this is looking already? Hold it to the light. Does it cover? Yes, it does. Okay. So it did its job. Now we put it face down. My name on that is really in the way, isn't it? Put it face down. Fold the paper out of the way. Folding that paper is really important. You don't want to accidentally cut through it. Zing off your excess. Notice I'm putting on my little scrappy doodles over here. I'm not actually throwing these pieces of fabric away because I could use them again later. All right. And then finger press into place. This is where you can start to use this little roller. It just makes everything nice and crisp without even having to have an iron. All right. Two more. Four. What questions do you have so far? I see a wonderful question from Sue. Sue says, do you stop at the end of the printed line and not overstitch? Correct. I will often overstitch by like one or two stitches, but not more than that. Uh, because it'll get in the way of the next round of fabric. That's a really, really great question. I also am not back stitching because that'll make my life harder if I need to pull this out. Uh-oh, my camera disconnected. What happened? Join. I was like, I hope y'all can't see me staring into this camera because it's not cute. Okay. Done. Done. And done. Here we go. I'm a, oh, I bumped my watch. That's what happened. So yes, I stop right at the end of the line. So let's see if I can zoom in a little bit so y'all can see this time. Oh, of course not. Okay. Here's the line. We're going to literally sew from one point to the other. So I put my needle down just before that line. You can see it's like a stitch or two. And then I go like one stitch over. Okay. I also don't back stitch because when I mess up, not if, we're all going to make goofy little mistakes when we're foundation paper piecing. Uh, when I mess up, it'll be really, really in my way if I have to pick out back stitching. Okay. And then hold it up to the light. Yes, it's doing its job. And we repeat that same process of fold the paper, trim the seam allowance. All right. Yeah. What other questions can I answer? Because we're now in the very repetitive part of this. Look how cute this is looking, though. You can already start to see, like, how adorable that's going to be. So cute. Last one. Hold it up and check it. Drop a pin in. And do just, like... I kind of smooth my fingers down the fabric as I'm getting ready to put it under my machine so that it doesn't accidentally catch on the feed dogs and fold up on itself. Because I have done that so many times where that little piece of fabric has folded up on itself and stitched all funky. Yeah. Yes, large enough to rip if needed. That's exactly it. All right, fold this up. That one is perfect. Okay. And trim your seam allowance. The other nice thing about having this add a quarter ruler with that little lip, because you could absolutely take a regular ruler and lay it down there, right? And put the quarter inch line, you know, right where you need to, to trim it. And it would work. But your fingers are a little bit more in danger that way because you're laying the ruler on an uneven surface, right? 
And so you run the risk of that ruler wobbling and catching your finger. So this is also a nice little safety buffer for your fingers. All right, so round one. Ta -da! Look how cute it is. It's adorable. Let's make those next edges look really cute too. I'm going to use this wild granny patch fabric. I'm going to scoot y'all over. And we're going to point this down more so my fingers are not so in the way. And remember that these next bits are bigger. Okay? So these triangles. So I'm going to, yeah. I'm just guesstimating how wide of a square I need. And I'm going to cut a strip of fabric off. I almost always work by cutting strips of fabric off my larger chunk of yardage, okay? Because if I were to just cut the square out of the corner that I need, it makes the whole piece less usable, right? So if I remove a whole strip, then I know that this is still a whole beautiful usable piece. This is the only funky bit. Okay, so especially like when I was doing the animal quilt that we looked at earlier, um, I had big chunks of fabric for that. And I would slice off just, you know, a three inch strip, a five inch strip, like bits and bobs here and there in order to be able to make what I needed. Same thing here. Let's double check that. Yep, that'll work. These don't have to be perfect squares. These don't have to be perfect cuts. I'm just using the ruler to be a little bit more safe, okay? Being able to cut strips of fabric off and then leave your yardage untouched also reduces some of the like mess and chaos of the thing because I can have all of this stacked with relative tidiness off to the side, right? And all my little working bits can be here and be as chaotic as they want to be. All right. Next one, we are doing number six. I'm attempting to go in numerical order. Right sides together. So now we have a guide, right? There's our point. Go up one quarter inch and drop your pen in. I like to manage the chaos when I'm sewing. I Anyone who sews around me with any regularity will tell you um, I'm a surprisingly ordered Muppet when it comes to my quilting space. I don't like a lot of creative mess. So any tip that I can have to keep track of things and make it a little less chaotic, I'm going to use it. The other thing that I will do, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful seam right there. Look at that. Oh, so good. The other thing that I will do um, is my big chunks of yardage on one corner. Yes, it is right sides together. I know it doesn't look like it. Like, look how much more vibrant it is on that side. Here, the light's better here. Do, do, do. Yeah. So it was, but always double check me because let me tell you how many times I have stitched it wrong on live camera. It happens to all of us. Fold that paper back. Trim your seam allowance. Um, the other thing that I will do is with my yardage, I will um, have a little sticky note and a wonder clip and I will number or letter, depending on how it's written in the pattern, the um, what fabric it is to the main piece of yardage. The other thing that I will do, and I wonder if I have my sample here, is if I'm doing a project that has a lot of colors, especially a lot of similar colors, I do, look at that. I will make a color chart like this where if, you know, if the pattern is numbered colors, one, two, three, whatever, I will write all that down. And then I'll actually write down the name of the color that I'm using. And I'll take a corner off of every piece of fabric and sew down this so that I have a quick reference card at all times. Because especially like this was for a dragon quilt that I did back in January. These four reds are just close enough that it made me insane to keep them track, to keep track of them while I was sewing. Okay. So this is really handy. If you're doing something where you're working with fabric you're unfamiliar with, or maybe you are working with the teaks, which can sometimes bleed a little bit more, you could take a white piece of fabric instead of a white piece of paper, take a Sharpie and write all this information down the side, sew your fabrics to it, take the whole thing and put it in the washing machine. And then you'll know which colors are going to bleed. Or if they're not going to bleed, like you'll know that right away. You'll also know what they look like 
as you're going along, right? So what's this going to look like after it's washed? So you can also make a washable color card. Um, we have a blog for that on our website, and I will grab you the link because who doesn't who doesn't love a good blog link, right? I cannot take credit for this tip. Um, one of the rock stars came in and she had done this and she pulled it out because she needed to match one of the colors on it. She was like, I ran out of such and such color and she pulls out this washable color card. And I was like, what the, you know, what is that? And she told me, and I was like, you've changed my life. I was like, Joan, this is amazing. So I will drop a link in the chat to Joan's brilliant color card idea. Okay. Yes. Little bowls for the flattish bits are so helpful. I agree. All right. Fold P6 back into place. And then we're going to find P7. All right. So there's seven. Same thing. Go to our point, go up one quarter of an inch. So once you get that first round on, it gets a lot better um, and a lot easier to guesstimate where your spot is ouch, going to be. I just got myself. Woo. All right. Oops, sketchy. That's Havana's best known and arguably least favorite command is when I tell her to oochie scoochie. Let me move my foot pedal. All right. Make sure it doesn't fold up on itself. Needle down. Let's see. I saw a question about needle down. Are you sewing needle down before you start sewing the seam? Yes. As illustrated right there, Holly. So I dropped my needle and then I start sewing. And just make sure nothing slides around, you know? I put a light under my sew study extension table to help me see my lines. That is a great tip. I have never tried that, but it makes me want to. I don't have a sew study for this machine yet. It's on my list for this spring, um, but I do for one of my other machines. And that would be very, very handy. Um, I also, I have a trash can sitting right here for all of my teeny tiny little bits because otherwise I will 100% just toss them on the floor. That's my chaos trait. Um, but I also have like kept a little mason jar on the desk. If I'm somewhere where I don't have a trash can handy, I'll just get a little mason jar and use it for all my little bits. All right. Fold that up. I trimmed it, fold it up, and we're going to repeat for the next one. Number eight. We're just going around clockwise at this point. My triangle one piece got caught up on sewing piece of number two piece. What did I do wrong? Got caught up on. What do you mean, Julia? It sounds like one of the pieces folded up on itself. Is that what you mean? Like, did it, did this like fold in? as you were sewing it, something like that, and get caught? Or did you forget to press one of them open? Let me know if that answers one of those questions. Do I find that reads, reds bleed almost all of the time? I don't work with red very often. I'm going to be honest. It's not one of my favorite colors. Um, I have not found that the Paintbrush Studio Solids reds bleed. Um, I've never had any issues with bleeding with the Paintbrush Studio Solids for what that's worth. But I always think reds and purples are worth checking. Yeah. There's that. Fold our paper down. Now, if you have sewn past this line, you may need to kind of pop the stitch. You can see one right here that I had to pop that stitch a little bit in order to fold my paper down. It's just the extra stitch. It's totally fine. Okay. An empty cube Kleenex box makes a great sewing space trash can. Love that tip too. See, this is what's fun about Bandcamp. I bring tips, but so do y'all. And y'all have good tips. All right, trim it, fold it open. Let's hit these with the ruler. I'm going to watch more carefully about what I'm supposed to be pressing in a watch direction. Great, great idea, Julia. And then see if it happens again. Like if it replicates or it might have been a fluke moment. All right. So see how everything, basically in between each piece, we press everything flat, like it's been pieced into spot because it has. All right, same thing here. Seam allowance, go up a quarter of an inch. And I'm going to be honest with y'all, I don't usually pin. Not for little pieces like this. I'll pin big pieces. But I will normally just carefully hold that in place until I get to the machine and then run it right under there, all right? 
fold the paper out of the way. So notice I'm doing a lot of flipping back and forth, right? I have the fabric right side up in order to sew it. And then I flip the paper up in order to trim. And I've got a couple little long seams here. So we'll just pull on those. There we go. Nope, this one. Trim the excess bits off. And then we open it up. And we've completed round two. One more to go, y'all. Look how cute. Is that not just the cutest little block? <laughs> it's so good. I'm obsessed with these fabrics. So we got these fabrics in and I love Ruby Star Society um, so much. In fact, I saw a meme yesterday. I think Kate sent it to me that she said, if you love, the, the meme was like, if you loved Lisa Frank as a kid, how's your Ruby Star Society obsession going? I felt attacked. It's fine. Um, but I did absolutely love Lisa Frank as a kid and I do absolutely love Ruby Star Society now. <laughs> All right, so this is an example where a chunk got cut out of this fabric. So when it's folded up, it can look like it's a whole fat quarter, right? But then you open it up and you're like, oh no, a piece is missing. This is why I like to just take a whole strip off so that I don't have that little like, oh no, surprise moment. So we're going to take a strip off of this. Watch your fingers. Please don't cut them. And then we're going to be able to cut the squares for our final round. Yes, this will be available on replay. It will be available as soon as I'm done. Where'd my block go? There it is. All right. That's plenty big enough. So we can cut you in half. Do be mindful. This is not like, this is just, just be mindful. This is, that's all this is. Asterisk. When I cut these pieces in half like this, I have created a triangle that is on the bias, right? So this is very, very stretchy. We're not doing a lot of manipulating with it before we put it onto our quilt. So it's not a big deal. We're in, you know, and then we're very quickly sewing it down. But it does mean that all of these guys can be a little bit stretchy. So just keep that in mind. I know a couple of foundation paper piecers um, who are very, very careful about never having bits on the bias for this reason. I have not found it to inhibit anything with my quilting, but it's just something to keep in mind. Don't overhandle the bits if you're going to cut them on the bias. Okay. Um, how this says, I'm freaking out while watching you because I've realized I've been doing my foundation paper piecing backwards. I've been sewing on the side where the template is printed. Oh my gosh, mind blown. Oh, like you've been putting your fabric on that side. Okay. So Heather, if you're getting the same results, that's okay, but it's harder to see what you're doing because then you're gradually covering your paper up. Right. So yeah, hopefully this helps. Yay. Okay. If you're having fun and you're getting the quilt done, that's the most important part. My job is just to make it easier to have fun while you're getting the quilt done. All right. Can you see what I'm doing? Yes. Here we go. All right. We're sewing our last round. I 100% skipped over to number 12 because I wasn't paying attention. That's okay. They're all the same. Here, I've sewn all the way through the seam allowance. Take note of that. All right, we've arrived in the outside bit of what we're doing. And this solid line is going to be the line where your finished block ends. This dotted line indicates the outside edge of your seam allowance. So on these final pieces, I'm sewing all the way through the seam allowance so everything stays nice and together, okay? Fold the paper out of the way. Every single foundation paper piecing pattern that you do, you are going to start at one and you're going to count up and you're going to apply the fabrics in that order, okay? That means that as we finish up this block, you can tackle any foundation paper piecing pattern that you want to. Levels of complexity are going to come in with really funky geometric shapes, trying to think through, okay, if I have to put the fabric here and then flip it up, is it going to flip up to fill that space the way that I think it's going to, right? That's where things get tricky. Um, and things can get tricky if there's a lot of fabrics involved and you're having to keep track of, wait, what color am I supposed to put here? Let me refer to my key, et cetera, et cetera, okay? The secret to all of it is to take your time and enjoy the process. And I remind myself often 
when I get, you know, caught in the fiddly throws of foundation paper piecing like that, that I got to jump straight into sewing. I didn't have to do a whole bunch of pre-quilting or a bunch of pre-cutting. And that makes foundation paper piecing a huge win for me. Foundation paper piecing is one of my favorite things to do when um, my brain is having trouble focusing to sew because I just have to tackle one piece at a time. All right, here, I'm going to perforate the paper right where I sewed across, okay? And then I can still fold it down out of the way, but it means that the seam allowance that, or the stitching that goes to the seam allowance will stay intact. But I find it very meditative and it's fun to watch the shapes emerge in real time. Um, oh, you have a fabulous peacock FPP pattern and it scares the heck out of you, Sue. I have two possible solutions. So step one is to make this block. Step two, you can make palazzo with me. And I would say as you're making palazzo, go ahead and start working on that peacock and just take it one step at a time. And here's the, here's the little added bonus. For Palazzo, I'm going to be doing monthly calls just like this, except they're going to be on Zoom. So you can actually show me what you're working on. And if you are working on Palazzo and your peacock at the same time and you get stuck, bring that peacock to our call and we can get you unstuck. All right, one more. Ta -da. Now, if you are uh, very perturbed by the fact that I'm not ironing this as I'm going along, I do have an Aliso mini iron um, and a wool mat. And so sometimes I set that up. So if you want to be able to actually press these with heat more often, that would be my recommendation is get a little mobile pressing board and a little mini iron and go about it that way. Okay. but I really don't find that it's necessary, especially with shapes like this. Sometimes I'll employ heat if I'm having trouble getting fiddly bits to sit still, but otherwise I just wait till the end. Focus, concentrate, tune out everything else. Yes, Sue, I love that you have that experience as well. I can just, I usually will put on an audiobook and I can just sit there and just putter along with it. I'm not very fast when I FPP, but I enjoy it. I find it really calming. All right. Last, last little seam allowance trim here. Look at this, y'all. All right. So this is where, if I had my iron handy, I would go hit this with an iron. Notice I would hit it with an iron before I trim it the rest of the way, okay? So I would actually, I would iron this and then I would spritz it with a little bit of starch and I would let that starch sit for about 15 seconds on that warm fabric. So the heat of the iron helps open up the fibers, right? The starch gets in there, it's gonna make it nice and crispy. And then I would iron this really, really flat and then put a clapper over it to suck the heat back out so I get a really crispy finish, okay? Then come back to your cutting mat. We're gonna scoot over so y'all can see. And we're gonna do our final trim of this block. This is where we get to use these again. Um, do you cut your threads close as you go? Yes, so I was using the scissor feature on the Burnett B77 and that scissor feature cuts them pretty tidily. You can see I've got just a few here um, that we could actually trim off if we want to but it cuts them pretty close. So I don't end up with a whole lot of like long extra threads as I'm going. If I am working, like if I'm working on the B38 for another machine that doesn't have a scissor feature, um, or no, the B38 does. If I'm working on the 37, which doesn't have the scissor feature, then yes, I'm trimming my threads as I go to keep them nice and tidy, okay? Um, are you starting the last seam off the edge like you are ending off the edge? Yes. So that last one, I start my seams way over here. And so all the way across through my seam allowance. Yep. Uh, Legit Kids Turtle Blog of the Month. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Okay, you've got this. You just take it slow, one piece at a time. I'll give you the same advice um, that I gave uh, Sue about the peacock. If you want to jump in on Palazzo and also bring your turtle to our Palazzo calls, 
they can be FPP Q&A calls, okay? All right, so finally, we're going to line up our little quarter inch on the solid line so that we're cutting on the dotted line. And we're going to do the final trim of this block. All the way around. Y'all, I'm so excited. It's going to be so cute. Also, I do take note, I used really loud prints on this. And yet, look at me. So, so fun. Perfect little stash buster. Perfect little introduction to this technique. All right. Now. I would leave the papers in this for right now. So here's our paper on the back. It's all nice and trimmed up. If we were putting this together into a kit or into a quilt, excuse me, we would take two sections. In this case, it's two blocks, right? But if it were, um, if we're building something like Palazzo or anything else, there are going to be chunks that you piece in a section and then you piece it to your next section and then you piece it to your next section. So like my guess is that this will probably be pieced in three chunks, right? one, two, three, and you would leave the papers in them until they're all together. Okay. So then you would line them up and you would line them up. So your seam allowances match. Okay. So that could even be on funky angles, depending on what you're piecing together. You would sew them together. And once, just like with EPP, once it's contained all the way around, then you remove your pieces. Okay. To remove your pieces, I can show you on the back here, all right, you would take a seam ripper and you can use um, a paintbrush with a little bit of water. You can buy tools that are little water pens if you want to help make this a little easier. But I will usually just fold the outer ones till I can pull them off. And then when I get to these inner ones, I just use my seam ripper to pick them up and then pop them out, okay? So it just allows me to get up under there. And then for little bits like this, if you've got serger tweezers or if you've got, you know, another pair of sewing tweezers you keep handy, you can use your tweezers to get up in there and pull those little bits of paper out, okay? That's about as small as I go. I am not overly anal about getting every last grain of paper out of my projects, all right? You did it. You did it, Rockstar. So here I can actually, oh, I can do it here. Let me pull this down. You have officially made your first foundation paper piecing block. And I am so excited to have gotten to do that with you. What questions can I answer about foundation paper piecing this lovely little block before we talk a little bit more about Palazzo? Oh, there, there it tried to do picture in picture. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, Sue says, don't worry about minuscule pieces of paper left in. It won't hurt it. It won't. Remember that paper is made out of tree pulp. It is another natural fiber. Um, it'll soften up nicely in the wash. You're never going to be able to feel it in there. Okay. It's not going to be a problem in the slightest. Great point. I mean, y'all look at this. So good. All right. So let's talk about your next steps. What happens now? You've learned how to make an amazing economy block. I really hope that you've learned that any anxiety that you've previously felt about foundation paper piecing can be easily assuaged with a little bit of fun, a few jokes, and just taking it slow. Uh, what quilt can we make next? Spoiler, let's talk about it. Okay. So let's talk about Palazzo. You could log off and say, well, that was nice. And you have a cute little block and you could, you know, do a little self-binding situation and make a little coaster and move on and never FPP again. But why do that when you can keep hanging out with all of these amazing rock stars, build a beautiful collection of thread and make an amazing quilt inside the Orifil Color Builders Block of the Month. So rock stars, I would love to officially invite you to Palazzo. We've been talking about uh, this quilt for close to a month now. I have been super secretly getting my hands on this panel and starting to work on quilting it uh, because I'm really stoked about this amazing opportunity. We've had so much fun with color builders in the past. And what I really, really like about this pattern is the opportunity to show off beautiful solids, to play with color, 
Um, and to do it in community while building this stunning collection of thread. But I know a lot of y'all who are here have also been in classes like Intro to FMQ and Free Motion Quilting Academy. Let me tell you, the first time that I did color builders, and I think Kate and I talked about this, I was like, how will I ever use 36 spools of thread? That is so much thread. And let me tell you, right before Orifil announced this year's color builders, because I didn't, did I collect last year? No, I collected two years ago. So it's been two years since I've, I've actually collected from color builders. I opened my thread drawer one day and went, oh my gosh, I don't have any thread. <laughs> like I've used all my thread work on things. What am I going to do? And I've been so, so thankful that having participated in color builders in the past, I had this beautiful collection. And then I've also been amazed at how I've sewn my way through it. So I'm really excited uh, to invite y'all into this, to help y'all build a beautiful color uh, collection and to help you build this amazing quilt. And by the end, even if you're still a little shaky with FPP after our time together today, you will not feel that way by the time we finish this gorgeous Palazzo quilt. All right. Uh, Sue says, use your FPP skills to make some mug rugs, make some mug rugs and make a quilt. I love it. Uh, Susan says, my IMG is so loud with FPP. Susan, tell me more about that. What is your IMG telling you? If, if you feel if you feel comfortable being that vulnerable, like is it saying like you're gonna always mess up, you're never gonna get it right? Like what is the let's let's talk through that. We can have, we have a little quilting therapy moment. Um, these are 50 weight threads. So uh, the endangered species a couple years ago was 40 weight. These are 50 weight, which is my personal favorite weight of thread because you can use it for everything. I use it for piecing. I use it for quilting. I use it for garments. I use it for applique. I use it for bags. I literally use it for everything. Okay. Um, yes, 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 yes. So it's the same colors as the animals from a few years ago, Sue, but different weight of thread. Jill, I'll get to your question in just a second. So the 2024 color builders includes monthly delivery of three large spools of Orifil 50 weight thread for a total of 36 boxes throughout the year. Uh, we use a different, we get a different color every month and you get a light, medium, and dark of that color, which I just think is so magical because it allows you to do so many different things, right? So we've got a, one for every color of the rainbow and then a couple of neutral boxes, okay? Um, these are different colors than the applique one. The applique had variegated. Yeah, great question, Sue. And it includes this exclusive foundation paper piece block of the month designed by Kitty Wilkin. Are the curves FPP? Yes, they are. How magical is that? So on um, these pieces, when you piece them together, you work at slight angles all the way around to create the visual illusion of a curve. So when you piece it, if you look very closely, you'll be able to see those tiny little straight edges. And then it, once you stitch in the ditch right around it, it smooths it out and it looks stunning like it was done as a curve. How cool is that? And it allows for this really precise spacing in between the sections of the block. All right. So in addition to your thread boxes and the pattern, I've also mentioned a few times, I'm going to be hosting exclusive monthly Zoom calls so that we can have little piecing parties so that we can talk this through together so that you can say, Holly Ann, I know you already showed me how to do this whole stitch and flip thing, but can you like do it one more time for me on this actual pattern so that I can see how it works? Plus, it's just really fun if you're going to be doing a block of the month, right, to get to hang out with your quilty friends while you're doing it. All right. Let's see. Susan says, I'm afraid that I'll never be able to cut the right size of piece. And when I fold back, it's not the right size. Susan, I can solve this so easily. Please cut really big pieces. For a little while, I want you to cut enormously, horrifyingly large chunks of fabric for your FPP and just trim them down after they're pieced in. And as you get the hang of that stitching and flipping motion, then you can work with your brain to say, okay, let's try cutting this a little more precisely. You can handle one seal at a time. You've taken my FMQA, you know, for free motion quilting, I talk a lot about let's try to work on skills in isolation. If you're, if you like Susan are nervous about, I'm never going to be able to get these pieces the right size. I'm always going to flip it up and it's going to be short on one side. Start by just cutting really, really big pieces and getting the motion of lining up your fabric, stitching on the line, trimming your seam allowance and putting your fabric into place. And then as you get the hang of that, then you can start to work on, can I be a little bit more precise in how I cut this fabric? You've totally got this rock star. I promise. Uh, LA says, do you piece everything with a neutral thread? Sometimes. 
sometimes it kind of depends on, you know, what's in my machine and how much I feel like changing my thread. If I'm real honest. I've pieced with some weird stuff lately. Um, if you ever happen to come by the shop or if you look at pictures of the shop online, we have a big Polaris quilt hanging right now. Um, there is a different color of bobbin thread every three blocks in that quilt uh, because I got decided that I wanted to clean out my bobbin donut. And so anytime my bobbin ran out, I just put another bobbin in with whatever color I grabbed first. So it kind of depends on the day. Uh, this will not be used up the scraps. It doesn't have to be used up the scraps yet. Susan, it doesn't have to be used at the scraps yet. It will be. You'll get there. So Palazzo is basically going to be the FPP party of the year. And I want you to join us because I want to continue the fun that we have had together today. So the Orifel Palazzo Color Builder Thread Subscription and Block of the Month includes your monthly delivery of three large spools of Orifel 50-weight thread, uh, which is, you know, approximately one trillion yards of thread, if you're wondering. I should know this as an aura philosopher off the top of my head, but I can never quite remember. Um, it's like 1300 meters or some insane number. Uh, it's an amazing amount of thread. And yet it is amazing how quickly you'll go through it as you're piecing and quilting your own projects. 36 different colors, a beautiful rainbow for all of your piecing, quilting, bag making, applique needs. It includes this exclusive block of the month designed by Orifil designer Kitty Wilkin. It includes a subscriber only Facebook group with Kitty and exclusive, if you sign up through me, monthly calls with me that we can be working on this together and I can help you get unstuck as we go along, keep your energy high and help you get to the finish line with this project. Plus, you know I'm going to be talking about quilting plans by the time we get to the end of this. 1,400 yards. Thank you, Kate. Kate. This is why Kate's here. Kate was like, hey, can I tune in? Do you need any help? And I was like, yes, help me with the stuff that I forget. <laughs> so, y'all, I've dropped the link down in the chat. Um, Stringastory.com forward slash Orifil Color Builders. We've already got a whole bunch of people who have jumped in and got their kits, which is so exciting. And we are going to be kicking off at the beginning of April. So, you'll see signups close on April 15th. Um, if you sign up now, you're going to be in our first round of shipping at the beginning of April. So you get your stuff sooner, the sooner you sign up. All right. So why do we love Orifil Color Builders? It uh, combines three of my very favorite things, quality supplies, gorgeous quilts, and the opportunity to grow community inside of the Quilting rock stars and to get to know your quilty friends. All right. Um, anyone out of the U.S. that signs, uh, outside of the U.S. that signs up locally, can they participate in with you in the monthly? Sue, send me an email. I got you, girl. <laughs> All right. Other important questions that you need answered in order to jump into Palazzo. Will we be offering a fabric bundle like last year? Yes. Shout out to Kitty who made a fat quarter friendly pattern. Fat quarter friendly pattern. We've made this beautiful bundle. We're calling it the Havana bundle because we had not yet named a bundle after my favorite sidekick. It is 28 fat quarters. So light, medium, and dark of your beautiful rainbow. And then four neutral colors. Uh, the four neutral colors, you will use your whole fat quarter. You've got a little bit more wiggle room in your colors. So it'll all come together from this plus a background. So for your background, I recommend linen, aluminum, or abyss. I can tell you right now, I'll be using abyss. That is 0% surprising to any of y'all who have been here for more than five minutes. I love a navy background, okay? Um, you need three and a half yards of background fabric to go with this bundle, okay? Um, yes, those of you who are part of the Quilting Rockstars community, if you are overseas and you have a local shop participating and you are also wanting the community support from the Quilting Rockstars, send me an email. We will talk that through and I'll make sure that you get on our list. I've got you. Um, can I ship overseas? Yes, I can ship overseas. Um, so that's something too that's actually changed, but I also know that shipping is a bit prohibitive. So if you are overseas and you want to sign up uh, with us, my recommendation is that you purchase all the threads at once. So I can ship all 12 of your thread boxes in one box so that you only have to pay one shipping fee. It saves you so very much money. Um, and then through that, we will then also put you in our Kajabi and patterns will drip out. So if you don't, if you're overseas, if you're international, you don't have um, a local shop participating or you prefer to just get everything all at once from me, we also have that option. Yes. So once again, the Palazzo Orifil Color Builders thread subscription and block of the month $40 a month plus shipping for 12 months. It includes your box arriving at your doorstep mid-month each month. It includes your pattern box getting released um, usually right at the beginning of the month. I think we're doing two blocks a month to build our beautiful Palazzo quilt. The Facebook group that Orifil and Kitty are providing and 
the monthly live with me so that we can be stitching together. So rock stars, jump in. Uh, if you have other questions about this, please give a holler in the chat. I am here to help. A couple more Q and A's. Can I buy just one month? No, it's a 12 month subscription. It all comes together, right? So all of this is a packaged deal. Uh, that's kind of the fun of it. The finish size of the quilt, I believe it's 60 by 60, but let me double check my emails because I want to get this right. <laughs> um, emails, there we go. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. 50 by 50, or you can add a border to bring it up to 56 by uh, 56. Mine is probably going to come out, if it's 50 by 50, 52... Mine's going to come out a little bit bigger than that because I'm going to put a piano keyboarder on it. Just like spoiler. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to end up using a little bit extra of some of these colors to make a piano keyboarder. But the official finish size is 50 by 50. Yes. Um, and I, Kate and Lacey, I love that you both were asking that question. Uh, do we have to buy the first? Do I have to pay for the first month now? Yes, because we are getting ready to ship the first round. So our first shipment of thread will leave Orifil HQ uh, on April 1st or 2nd and make its way to us. We then turn it around very quickly to get it out the door to y'all. So the sooner you sign up, the sooner you get in that shipment so that we can get your things out to you as quickly as possible. The first pattern will be available at the beginning of April as well. And we'll send an email out to all subscribers when that happens. All right. So uh, for, it's about $45 a month. It's $40 a month plus shipping. If you're in the U.S., our shipping is $5. So your total cost comes out to about $45 a month for 12 months. Internationally, it's $40 plus your international shipping rate. Like I said, I do recommend um, doing it, like buying all of your threads at once. And I can give you a link for that if you email me. But that's stringandstory.com forward slash Orifil Color Builders with all the details so that you can get signed up to make this gorgeous quilt. Thank you for being here today. Y'all, I'm so excited. We finished in under 90 minutes, which is really what I wanted because I know that any longer than that, it can get really overwhelming. Um, how much do y'all love this quilting? I'm so obsessed with how much the texture adds to this quilt. And it makes me even more excited to actually piece the full size version. So this one is 36 by 36. Um, it, it's going to be quite a bit larger when we get it all pieced. And I'm stoked. All right, Rockstar's last call for questions. Sue, I'm so glad you are here. Lacey, Kate, others, thank you for being here with me live. I hope that you deeply enjoyed making your very first little economy block. I hope this showed you that you can foundation paper piece. I know that this is a technique that can inspire a lot of fear and uncertainty. I know there's a lot of scary language often used about how hard foundation paper piecing is. The secret is to take it slow. Remember my number one tip to use solids because then you don't have a wrong side of fabric. Um, and play around with scraps. Don't be too precious about it. And dive into this for even more practice with me over the next year. All right? Rockstars, you've got this. Melanie, you can do it. I cannot wait to see y'all inside of Color Builders. Um, give. It's addicting, so hold your hat. Yes, Sue, it's so addicting. <laughs> I agree. Um, I was, when we did the endangered species a couple years ago, I would consider, have considered myself a very beginner foundation paper piecer. I had only done these um, and I was making all of the FMQA or FMQ education for that program. And I remember being so nervous and I was addicted by the end. And I love foundation paper piecing now, which is why I get so fired up about getting to share it with y'all. And I'm so excited for our year ahead. All right. I'm dropping that link one more time. I will see y'all inside Color Builders. Have a beautiful rest of your Saturday. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. Bye for now.